This is my 14th video on my attempts to construct a small OO gauge layout. See part 1 for my reasons for doing this and my lengthy series on my N-gauge railway modelling for more interesting stuff with trains actually running, etc. This part covers my second build from a super quick card building kit, this time the Swan Inn. <laughs> I was reasonably happy with my first build from a super quick kit, AO6, signal box coal order office in line side huts, so I decided to try another super quick kit to fill out the village in my little OO gauge layout, and I chose B21, the Swan Inn, since it represents an interesting and distinctive building quite appropriate for rural England. And here's what you get when this kit is taken out of the bag. One folded sheet of printed card parts, a sheet of clear acetate glazing parts, a paper sheet with ridge tiles, curtains, etc., and a single sheet of instructions, and a warranty card. A couple of points are worth noting here right at the start before getting into the build details. Super Quick seem to make their printed card parts from a white paper face glued to a brown card backing. And in this case, the sheet is a bit of a hybrid, since the left-hand edge strip, as seen here, is just paper. The brown card backing stops where the dotted line can be seen. Another point worth noting is that Superquick don't use heavy card strengtheners or laser cut parts, or at least not in the kits I've seen. So there is nothing more rigid than the basic card parts, and folding tabs are used to help take out warps and keep these parts straight. Another issue I dwelt on a bit in my previous Super Quick build is that they give you very little in the way of borders around their transparent glazing parts. The Super Quick instructions actually suggest attaching these parts to the card parts using sticky tape rather than gluing them, but I'd be afraid they'd tend to fall off inside the building after time if they were attached that way. So I glue them on anyway, but it's tricky to do without getting glue on the windows themselves with such narrow borders around the glazing. And finally, before we get to actual building the instructions. As you can see here, they don't have a lot in the way of illustrations, and they rely very heavily on verbal instruction as to how to put things together. If you didn't read and understand English well, I think you'd be totally lost trying to understand the instructions and build one of these kits. I reckon my English comprehension is pretty good, and I still had to read sentences in the instructions several times whilst peering closely at the parts in order to figure out what they meant. So on to the actual build. This is the main wall part for the principal section of the building. Pretty typical of super quick parts, tabs all along the bottom which will be folded over and will help keep the walls straight. The little red arrows indicate fold lines where things are folded back away from the printed side. These are definitely helpful, however oddly enough they don't print anything on the parts sheet to show you where you need to cut to take out the individual parts, and given how close together everything is on the sheet I often struggled to tell where one part ended and another part was supposed to begin. Also note that to save space, one of the dormer window parts is embedded in this wall part. At the back are other pieces associated with these walls, corner braces and a cross base in a yellow colour, and barge boards. The instructions said to attach the barge boards to the peaks of the walls right at the start. However, I was nervous about doing this and set them aside to be attached after the roofs were on. The identifiers for the various doors and windows are printed on the pieces that will be pushed out of the holes where those items go, but once the pieces are pushed out of the holes, it will be very easy to get confused as to the respective IDs of the different holes, so I penciled the IDs on the back of the wall before taking the pieces out of the holes. Here is the main wall with all of its scrap removed, except for one piece between two left-hand tabs which I missed. Here is the glazing sheet. It has no IDs printed on it, well there wouldn't really be room. Um, a key is provided on the instruction sheet as seen at top left here. I don't know why they distinguished between C's and F's particularly since they seem to be exactly the same. Oh no, I guess they're not. I guess they're, they're, cross, they're, they're the same size, but the, um, the cross pieces in them are different. 
Now I folded back and glued the tabs, glued on the glazing parts and doors, and attached paper curtain pieces behind the windows. And here is that wall from the outside. It's nice to have some patterned curtains as well as plain coloured ones. You can see the curtains from the two windows on the left are a sort of red and white check pattern. The kit does actually assign specific curtains to specific windows. They don't just give you a bunch of curtains and leave it to you to decide where to put them. The yellow corner braces glue into the corners of the walls over the folded tabs, establishing the right angle. The corner braces, in combination with the tabs, shape this building quite well. Here you can clearly see what I mean about the printed parts being made of white paper, printed and with a brown card backing. So the back of everything is brown. Finally, the last wall of this rectangular section is closed up and glued at the corner. I was pleased to find that it actually fitted very well. Then a cross brace is glued between the walls in the middle, another help to eliminate warping. Now the roof of this section can be formed. The roofs of this building are rather unusual and distinctive, having sections at the bottom which slope out more shallowly from the main peak of the roof. I'm sure there's some specific name for this type of roof, but I can't recall what it is. In order to create this shape of roof, it's necessary to bend the bottom part of the roof outward towards the printed side. This is a little tricky to do without damaging the printed surface. As indeed the instructions note, they suggest checking for wrinkling and trying to remove it by rubbing over with something smooth. These are parts for the dormer windows that will go into the roof of the main building section. I've already glued the glazing parts to the backs of these. The dormer windows then fold up and fit into the roof over the tabs in the main roof part which are bent back. This actually works quite well. Then flat roof parts glue on top of each of the dormer windows. Next, paper gutters are to be made up and glued to the edges of the roof. It appears that these are typical of uh, super quick kits, as both buildings in the other kit I used uh, had exactly the same arrangement. I can't say that I like this, as it isn't really possible for the paper gutters to be really rigid, so they tend to bend about randomly rather than staying at the intended angle. Still, I suppose it's good to have some sort of representation of guttering. The paper gutters have to be cut out, they're not pre-cut. Then two folds need to be made along the length of each. This is most easily done after scoring, using the edge of a thin metal ruler, but it still isn't all that easy. Then the black section is folded in two and glued, leaving a double thickness black section and a grey tab. The idea is then to fold the tabs at an angle to the black sections and glue the gutters to the edges of the roofs. As you can see here, the various sections of guttering are labelled as to which building section they belong to. You can then figure out from the length exactly where to attach them to the edge of the roof. Here I've tried to fold the tabs at the correct angle. I've also tried to blacken the folded black sections, which otherwise tend to show white edges and dotted lines, which don't look very sensible. And the gutter sections are glued to the edges of the roof. Not terribly satisfactory, but better than nothing, I guess. The instructions say to set this building section and its roof aside at this point without attaching the roof. The different roof parts will fit together in a rather complex way, and this will be done later after the various building sections are together. So now we move on to section 2 of the building, which starts with the main wall part with tabs to be folded and waste sections to be removed, similarly to section 1. Here I have gathered the additional pieces that will be required for the wall of section 2. Glazing parts, curtains, a door with its own glazing piece, and a paper printed display for the back of the off license. Tabs are folded forward rather than backward and glued where the off-license back display will go. Then the off-license back part is glued over those tabs. As you can see, it doesn't fit exactly over the tabs and the instructions don't mention this, so I just glued it more or less in the middle. 
Now the glazing pieces glue to the back and get curtains, and the door with its own glazing pieces glued in place. And here is that wall from the outside at this point. Now all of the bottom tabs fold back and are glued. Note how the second tab from the left is shaped at the end so it can fit under the door when it folds back. Again, corner braces are glued over the bottom tabs to fix the walls at right angles. And then the walls are folded closed and glued at the last corner to form the building. This seems to work better than you might expect. Again, a centre brace is added to keep the walls straight. This section has a particularly complex roof, as in addition to the sloped out sections of the bottom, it has cut-offs at each end of its peak, and a place for the attachment of another roof section on one side. And, of course, it gets its own paper gutters done as before. Here you can see I've done my best to thoroughly blacken them before attaching them. I cut some pieces of paper to help join up the ends of the roof, where the peaks are sort of cut off in a little sort of half pyramid kind of thing. I'm not sure the paper joiners really helped much, but I did manage to get the ends of the roof to go together reasonably well. Again, a dormer window is fitted into this roof in the same manner as those on the roof of section 1. And again, the instructions say to set this section and its roof aside without attaching the roof. In front here, you can see paper parts for chimneys and ridge tiles, as well as some additional glazing and detailed parts that are still to be fitted. This is the small wall part for section 3, the last section of the building, which is essentially the off license. As usual, waste parts are removed and bottom tabs are folded over and glued. There is a paper part for the window display, and this has tabs at each end that are folded over and glued. However, I found that the window display with its tabs folded over simply would not fit between the wall and the door, so in order to make it fit I had to slice quite a bit off each side. Here's the outside with the window display fitted. Now the sign for the inn name goes over that window. The walls of this section are then glued around a floor piece which fits above the bottom tabs. You can see here how I slice down the window display part. Then this assembled section is glued to a paving base, into which it didn't really seem to fit properly, being a bit too small for the gap in the paving. Now that section and its paving base are glued to the front of section 2 and two pieces are glued in front of the off-license door making steps. Note that the only way that the display at the back of the off-license will be seen is through the glazing of the off-license door. Finally, we can start to attach the roofs. The complex roof of section 2 goes on first. It needs to be flush at the left side, as seen here, as that side will be gluing to section 1 of the building. There's nothing really to support the sloped sections at the base of the roof, other than gluing them to the walls beside them. Now the roof for the off-license gets its own paper gutters as before. And that roof is glued in place, integrating quite oddly with the roof of section 2. I found this quite hard to get on satisfactorily. Then the assembly of sections 2 and 3 is glued to the side of section 1. Quite tricky to get the roof, the walls and the paving base to all go together properly. And then the roof of section 1 can go on, integrating closely with the roof of section 2. I suppose that perhaps if I had glued the barge boards on previously, as the instructions said to, they might have helped in attaching this roof. But in fact, I glued the barge boards on after attaching the roofs. They didn't turn out to be much overhang at this back end of the roof, so I omitted the backing piece when attaching this barge board. These kind of adjustments are why I prefer to attach the barge boards last. The other barge boards were attached with their backing spaces behind them. I had to trim the spaces a bit for the barge board over the name sign, as the sign didn't leave enough space for the ends of those spaces. 
The chimney stacks come as paper parts to be folded into shape. I'm not very happy with this, as unsupported paper parts don't make very rigid chimneys. Four chimney pots are needed, but only two parts are provided. The instructions say to roll the two parts and then cut them in half. You can see here from the package illustration what we are aiming for with the chimneys. Having tried to work with the super quick chimneys on my previous build, in this case I elected to use some leftover Metcalf chimney pots that I had. The Metcalf chimney pots are a pain to make up, but the super quick ones are worse, very hard to roll and almost impossible to cut in half usefully. So I cut Metcalf strips for the chimney pots of this building and rolled up four parts as best as I could. Then I blackened the ends of the pots with a marker. Now the pots are glued onto the chimney tops, which in turn are glued onto the folded chimneys, which slot into place in the roofs. They do fit quite well, though they tend to be wobbly, being only paper. Next, ridge tiles need to go onto the roofs. I used a red marker to colour the edges and folds of these first tile sections. But then I decided that orange would be a better match, and I used an orange marker for the remaining ridge tile sections. The ridge tiles go in place on all of the roof ridges. It's extremely awkward to get the ones on the complex ends of the Section 2 roof to join up together properly. This is how the paper parts for those ends come. I did my best to get them on sensibly and join them up with the other tile sections. This did require some trimming down of those parts. And here is the building basically completed. It does need more colouring work on the edges, although the super quick edges tend to show less obviously than Metcalf edges, as Metcalf parts are printed on white cards, so the edges show entirely white, whereas super quick parts are printed on white paper with brown card backing, so the edges just have a very thin white strip, but are mostly brown. The only part that hasn't been fitted yet is the inside. This is supplied as a card part to be folded to make it two-sided. The instructions say to attach it to the off-license without specifying exactly how, so I assume the idea would be just that you sort of glue the edge of the sign to the building wall somehow. I figured that I could probably do something a little better than that. Here's the sign part before folding. After folding and gluing, I tried to blacken all the edges of the sign. Then I cut a piece of heavy card to make a top for the sign and blackened that. I attached that top to the sign. Then I found a small piece of card to make attachments for hanging the sign and cut a piece of toothpick to serve as a hanging pole. Small pieces of card were glued to the top to serve as hanging attachments. Next, the piece of toothpick was painted black. Also, I painted all the edges of the sign and the attachment parts black as well. I decided to attach the sign to the main part of the inn rather than to the off-license, as this seemed more reasonable to me. I made two holes in the walls, one for the main sign bar and one for a brace. I glued the sign to the painted toothpick, which was to serve as its hanging bar. Then I cut a piece of fine piano wire to serve as the brace. The toothpick was pushed through the wall first, then the piano wire was pushed through the upper hole and glued to the toothpick. I did use a pin vise with a fine bit to drill a little hole in the end of the toothpick before mounting it to make it easier to attach the end of the piano wire. So finally, here is the completed building with its sign. I placed the inn tentatively on the layout. The white template beside it is for the Metcalf Town End Cottage, which will be my next build. Once I confirm exactly where it is going, I will need to bed the inn into the ground better. Still, I'm reasonably happy with how this area is coming together. You can see that I finally got my backdrops mounted as well. That wasn't an easy job either and didn't go perfectly. 
Here's the view across the village so far. And here looking back the other way. And here finally is a 1930 Bentley from Oxford Diecast parked outside the Swan Inn.